Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see a number of you who are first timers with us, and uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, pray that uh, God will bless you uh, even this morning through the worship, our time together, and also in the message. The, uh, just a correction the Friday uh, joint prayer meetings of Westminster churches held in the Westminster Chapel is at 7 p.m. Uh, if you come a bit earlier at 6.30, there'll be time for you to uh, mix around with other brothers and sisters from the local churches. So it's a great time for us to know other people as well. And uh, if you turn to your bulletin, you find that there is an emergency prayer meeting for all of us together with Emmanuel Northwest Church this coming Tuesday uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. gathered here. Why? Because we really believe that it's a time to pray for many of those who are sick uh, in our midst, it seems to be just a sudden uh, influx of uh, people having all types of sicknesses, uh, mental issues and cancer even, and, um, uh, all, uh, and uh, some, some of them are sort of uh, relatives of our church members, so I really sense that we need to come together to have a corporate uh, prayer, all right? So fast and pray uh, on that day, this coming Tuesday, and gather here from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Well, we warned last week that God will give us strength, uh, but we will be tested in our faith. This is all part and parcel of raising an army for God to be a follower of Jesus. Also means that we may have to move out of our comfort zone, be prepared uh, to serve God, to be ready when God calls us to do certain things. And of course, our warfare is not fighting with our fists or with uh, spears and guns, but it's really on our knees, our battle is always on our knees. So we have to learn how to battle uh, in order to grow to be the person that God wants us to be. So let's uh, pray as we look into the letter of uh, Ephesians. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who speaks to us. We thank you that you're a God who enables us and wants us to be strong in our spirit, to be strong in our inner man, to know you more, to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind and strength. So, Lord, we pray that today, as your servant speaks, that Holy Spirit come and anoint all of us to hear you speak clearly, personally, relevantly in our situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I believe God's word is a living word. Amen? That God's word brings life. God's words bring us to have hope in Him, uh, to be able to know and to love the invisible God. And today we are starting a new series in, uh, on the letter of Ephesians. And this uh, letter was chosen not because, as uh, someone would say, that it's the crown of St. Paul's writing. Or Samuel Coleridge labeled it as the most divine composition of man. Or was it because it has a lot of practical instructions how to be a soldier of Jesus? All these are really good reasons but because I sense in my spirit that this letter, God has spoken to me one morning to say, I want you to learn to apply this letter of Ephesians, not only to yourself, but also to my church at Emmanuel. Learn to live out, learn to lay hold of the truth found in the letter of Ephesians. Just a quick introduction uh, to this letter from Paul. Uh, it was obviously written by him. Uh, he he put, that in, put, that, uh, put that down in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And the scholars would say that very likely it was written around the year AD 62 uh, in Rome while he was in prison. Because three times he referred himself as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ in this letter. For example, in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he would write, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you, Gentiles, and so on. And the commentators would say that this letter is probably a, a circular letter. In other words, it's not just a letter to the church at Ephesus, but it's a letter to be passed around to the region in Asia at that time. Uh, why do we say that? Because inside this letter, there was no specifics about names of people uh, in the church, which is not normally the case in his other letters to churches. There was no mention of any specific a work that the church has done that Paul would comment on, which he normally would do, nor did he deal with any specific heresies. Uh, so generally people believe this letter is just is a circular 
letter. And what about the city of Ephesus? If we understand the city of Ephesus, we may discover a little bit more about the congregation, the people that uh, worship in that place. Well, the city of Ephesus was a very busy port, which since has been silted up over thousands of years. And it was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. You can just flip to uh, the LCDs. Yeah. In present-day Turkey. So if you show, you can see that this is the amphitheater, mentioned in the book of Acts, where there was a riot that, that took place. And um, was there a map that was shown just now? Back. Yeah. So today, you find that Ephesus um, is now located in Turkey. The city was also very famous for a particular cult of the goddess Diana or Artemis. And there was a huge temple built for her. More than 100 over columns uh, were used to build this temple. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 19, we write about Paul staying in Ephesus for two years. He was very successful, obviously, because uh, the blacksmith that were making the statues of the goddess felt threatened in their business because of the number of people turning away from the worship of this goddess, uh, Diana or Artemis, to the living God. And so from here, we can perhaps guess that it must be a quite sizable congregation. Paul has been there for two years. It must be a very big city, uh, comprising mainly Gentiles, they are non-Jews, from all walks of life, just like the city of London, for all of you here, all walks of life, uh, from a whole range of uh, economic you know, status, some may be rich, some may be poor, but you'll find that uh, people would know a lot more about the difference of religion and so on in that particular city. So in that, uh, with that background, let us read the passage for today, chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 14. Incidentally, from verse 3 to verse 14, in the ancient Greek, uh, the way that Paul has written, because Greek has no, ancient Greek has no pauses, no full stop, and so on, it seems like it's one long, complex sentence uh, in the doxology and praise that God started this letter with after his greetings to the saints. So let's read together from chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is where we need to like, take one long breath and without breathing, we need to read all the way through to verse 14 because that's the way it was written in Greek. Are you ready? Okay. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted. Oh, sorry, you run out of breath. Okay. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Are you still breathing? Good. Good. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Oops, sorry. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. 
Wow. You will not, first of all, have guessed that Paul was actually a prisoner at that time when he wrote these beautiful words. In fact, he referred three times. He obviously was mindful of his situation, his circumstances, as somebody who's languishing, you know, in, in confined quarters. But here, you can even sense as if Paul was submerged in his adoration and praise as he looked towards God, as he marveled at the plan of God that was revealed to him. He called that as the mystery of God's will being revealed. It's great because in the letter of Ephesians, you all, you all have very practical uh, instructions and commands from Paul in subsequent chapters. But here at the very beginning of his letter, he wants us to really look at God from a heavenly perspective. So often we start off, you know, by just looking at our circumstances. But this is different. Paul looks to God at the very first instance, despite the fact that on earth he was in prison. His spirit was set free. He was able to worship God. He was able to understand through revelation the plan of God. Someone would say that we enter this epistle through a magnificent gateway. This is how someone describes it. Or others will say it is a golden chain of many links or a kaleidoscope of dazzling lights and shifting colors, while others uh, would comment. But do you know that God, uh, that Paul actually looks at the overall blueprint of God? Who have guessed, who have guessed that this is a way in which God would save fallen humanity? That the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God, Jesus, actually would become a sin bearer and therefore to pay the ransom for humankind. The Bible tells us that angels try to peep into the, the, the plan of God for a long, long time. How would God be able to save the fallen humanity? How would God be able to restore a creation that has rebelled against him. Prophets of old were trying to understand how is God, what is God saying in all this? How is God going to bring about his kingdom? In fact, salvation is uppermost in God's mind, the plan of saving humankind. We see that word hidden in verse 13. Salvation is uppermost in God's mind. Because if you understand this plan of God that Paul was so ecstatic about, you'll be able to um, answer many of the existential questions that people around us in London would be asking. Who am I? Asking for your identity. Is there a purpose? Why am I here? Is there a purpose? Is there God asking for my origin? Why is there evil and suffering? Asking or sharing my dilemma. Is there life after death? Dealing with my fear. Will there be a judgment of the wrong things I do? Dealing with one's guilt. If you can understand this passage, the blueprint of God's plan, you'll be able to answer most of these questions. And it's important in life because so often we are trapped like Paul, you know, in the prison. And unlike Paul, we will just look around and say, I'm trapped inside my situation. Whereas Paul was able to leap out of his prison into the spiritual plane, so to speak, to be able to have the vista from heaven, to see from one end of eternity to the other end. Not just three dimensions, but four dimensions. And with that view, you'll be able to deal with issues that you confront while on earth, to deal with sufferings, to deal with bereavements, to deal with questions that have seemingly no answers. I'll give you an example, you know. You know that uh, I've recently become a grandpa. And um, my, my daughter, when she was giving birth, if you have taken a snapshot of her at the point of her giving birth, her face must be contorted with pain. I was told that a pint of blood was lost. Imagine a photo taking, uh, being, uh, being taken and there was this pool of blood and if you have an audio recording of her screaming in pain and if you just look at that segment of time you'll say oh dear somebody was really going through a very hard time it may even be a torture 
That's because you have, you're, just, you're just able to look at that particular instant of time. But if you're able to see the beginning of her desire and her husband to, to have a child, and the fact that she was uh, pregnant, and her, her tummy grew and grew and grew, and then to that point where she has to give birth, yes, there was pain, there was blood, there was screaming, and so on. But after that, you saw, you see that, you know, the baby was born, she was happy, and the results were worth it compared to that momentary affliction. So in the same way, if you are able to look at the plan of God from one end of eternity to the other end, it will help us when we go through those momentary afflictions, just as Paul was going through. So it's very important for us to understand this passage. Also, this passage talks about doctrines, all right? These are the backbone of our Christian belief. Because many people out there in London would say that all you need is just to lead a religious life, a good life, morally upright life. That's all you need to do. Not knowing that here in this doctrine, it's important for us to know the plan of God. Because the ways of God in reconciling or bringing people back to Him is different from that of the world. So Paul described this as God's blueprint of great blessing. Paul started off by praising God and saying, Blessed be God, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is in the heart of God. To bless us with every spiritual blessing, even in the heavenly places. That we are destined to be blessed. This is in the very heart of God. Now we need to understand what is this blessing. Right? To be blessed is more than just to be happy or prospering in, uh, in material blessings, as most people on this earth will think. To be spiritually blessed may not be just material blessings. But crucially, it's about a happy, to be blessed is to be happy. But in the relationship with God, so it's a happy and contented relationship with God, whose spirit, regardless of your external circumstances. God may not necessarily answer all your prayers, even of your material uh, situation, because God may test us in certain situations. But you're always, always guaranteed that you're spiritually blessed. That this is... Uh, what God intends you to have so that you will be victorious in every circumstance. So that just like Paul says in Philippians 4 verse 12, that he can say, that God will say, uh, sorry, that you will be able to say like Paul, that I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is when I have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. Or in, in other words, I learned the secret of being blessed in the Lord. In any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in lack, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. This is a guarantee that God says, I have given you every resource to be victorious. I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing. I make sure that you will be successful as a victorious Christian in your walk with me. I've given you every spiritual blessing to be fruitful in your life. But it's in the heavenly places. In other words, it is... First of all, establish in the heavenly realms, not just on the physical realm. Because if you are prospering in the heavenly realm, you will prosper also in the material realm, in that sense. But very often, our minds are set on the things on earth rather than on things on heaven. And that's where we failed. Why is things not happening in the, in the right way? It's because maybe we have not really engaged with God, appropriate God's promises, which is for us in the spiritual realm. I give an example of our brother, Kenny Gunn, who has now gone to glory. He was suffering a cancer. I mean, he, a couple of weeks before he died, he was in the Philippines, still preaching God's word, still being content and ready to meet his heavenly father. I think he's spiritually blessed, even though on earth you would say that, yes, he was going through a pain and suffering. So what more can we learn from this blueprint of God? of the spiritual blessings. One great spiritual blessing when we look at verse 4 is that God has chosen you before the creation of this world. That God has chosen you before the creation of this world. Now that is a very loaded statement. In other words, first of all, God must have known you. Otherwise, He would not choose you. And God has known you not 
just this morning, you may have just walked into church, that you may have thought that God has known you a, a week ago, a month ago. No, it's before that. Not 10 years before. Before you were born, He knew you. Before your father got married to your mother, He already knew you. Before Adam and, uh, and Eve came on this, on this earth, He already knew you. He has chosen you before the creation of the world. That is amazing. That how could God knows me from the beginning? Before the foundation of the world, way back in eternity, God is already thinking of you and of choosing you. Before you're even born, before you, committed, before you have committed any sins, before you have done good works, it is not in that equation. God says, I have chosen you. I chose you before the creation of the world. Therefore, in the Psalm 139, it says, how precious, in verse uh, it's 17, how precious to me, this psalm is, I, I believe it's David, if I'm not mistaken, he said, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. This is David knowing that God is thinking about him. How wonderful it is that God is thinking about each one of us way back before you were born. And do you think that God will forget you in, fut in the future? Of course not. He started to think about you, choosing you long before the world was made. And I tell you that long after things happen, you know, into the future, into eternity, God is still thinking about you and has his plan for you. You must always remember of this great blueprint of God. Lest you lose sight of God's purpose, because you are pressurized, just as Paul was in his prison cell. And the Bible tells us here in this passage that it is a triune, the one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all together working to fulfill this plan, that the Father purposed this blueprint. And Jesus, the Son of God, went, uh, put on flesh, uh, and, and um, became the sin-bearer, he became our redeemer. We talk about here being redeemed. That he shed his blood in order to save us. And it talks about the Holy Spirit living in every believer from then on until the very end. When God chose you, the word choosing is not like, I say, okay, I want to choose a few volunteers to help to clear up this auditorium afterwards. Is there any volunteer I want to choose? Otherwise, I have to choose you. And all of you will look away and sort of like duck and dive and look at your Bible, suddenly the Bible comes up and so on. <laughs> Why? Because you don't want to be chosen. But if I say, hey, the Queen has written me a letter and, he say that, and she said that I want to give an OBE, Order of the British Empire, to the best member of the church who has given uh, the community great services. Wow, it was like... <laughs> but I tell you, this choice is even better than that. It's a choice to bring you uh, into God's purpose and plan, as we're going to see. That's another blessing which I'll mention. But the, the, the even more remarkable fact is that, do you know that we can never really want to know God as a fallen human being, as a, as a sinful person? It is not in our heart to really want to submit ourselves to God. And yet God says, I chose you. Why do I say that? In Romans chapter 8, verse 7 to 8, Paul wrote, uh, wrote these words. He said, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. In other words, we start off with already a, rebellion, a rebellious streak in us. We say, I'm not going to submit to God's law. Now, how would God choose you when all of us start from that sort of baseline? I remember when I was 15 years old, I was not a believer. Um, I live in a house where two roads away will be the Assembly of God Church. And every now and again, there will be these groups of young people coming to give out tracts, trying to convert people to become Christians. And I would fob them off by saying, no, I'm a staunch Buddhist. And I always take delight and grimace at, you know, their disappointed looks to say, oh, I failed to convert this guy. You know, they walk away sadly because I'll just fob them off. And I feel so glad and proud of myself that I can just defeat these Christians, just like that, just with a simple statement. My classmate was worse. He made fun of Jesus, uh, of Jesus' name. And he used all types of, uh, write all sorts of poems and so on to make fun of Jesus. 
So that's how we, we started. That's our baseline. I don't have anything to do with Jesus. My mind was hostile against God. But God chose my blasphemous friends. Years later, he was working for the navigators. So I was very surprised that somebody who really disrespected Jesus would become a Christian. And of course, I became a Christian when I came here as well, by the grace of God. So I thought that, hey, I'm the one who chose God, right? I remember the day I said, yes, Lord, I surrender my life to you. So how come he says that there's no way that we could even choose God because our mind was hostile to God. Our sinful mind was hostile to God. But do you know that in the first place, you choose God because God chose you first? Because I look back, it was these Christians coming to knock at my door that God has sent. He has chosen me. And I was always troubled by all these downtrodden, disappointed looks of these Christians. Although in my heart, my sinful nature said, yes, God, get them away, yes. But deep in my heart, I felt like, why were they so sad? Maybe what they want to share with me is true. And I just chased them away without giving myself an opportunity to know. And that has always haunted me for many years. So you see, God has chosen me. And I'm sure as you look back into your life that, you know, you may be chosen to be born into a Christian home. And how your parents share with you about Jesus. And you may say, I don't know about this Jesus. But somehow there, is a, there was a connection and became a Christian. And others will maybe, uh, maybe from a non-Christian background. And you can recall how God has been chasing after you by sending Christians, by giving, I don't know, tracts or verses that just come along your way, even though you try to push Jesus away. This is the way that God chose you. And Pastor Timothy Keller has this great words to say that your choice to follow Jesus is a penultimate choice. All right, it's a penultimate choice. While God's choice is the ultimate. It is God's choice to choose you first, that you choose God. Does that make sense? Therefore, Jesus said in John 6, chapter 6, verse 44, He says, No man can come to me unless the Father who sends me draws him, and I will raise him up at that last day. That's all part of the plan in Ephesians 1, that the Father will send people because the Father has chosen. And this, the Lord Jesus said, I will then raise him up on the last day. So you must be very secure because God has chosen you. You know, sometimes you feel that, hey, my Christian faith is a bit wobbly and so on. You need to be reminded by Paul saying that God has chosen you before the creation of this world. God has chosen you. And we need to respond with that choice. And others may start to ask the questions like, okay, if God chose people, then forget about the healing on the streets. Forget about sharing the good news, Right? After all, who can uh, defeat God's will and purpose? But do you know that part of God's purpose is to use you as part of His plan, that you are His co-worker, that it's through your actions that God's plan is going to be fulfilled. Therefore, Jesus said, be my witnesses. I'm with you always. Fulfill the great commission. Go and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. So we need to work alongside God's plan. But we must be confident, you know, that God has chosen people and we are His instruments. Of course, we do not know who has chosen, but we just have to keep preaching the good news. Some of you may start to think and say, hey, it's not fair, then why would God choose some and not others? Especially they are better than some of these Christians that were saved. You may ask that question. But do you know that the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death? So it does not really matter whether you consider yourself good or bad people. All have sinned against God. All have committed a treasonable offense that deserves death. This is what the law of God says. The wages of sin is death. So you may be the best person. You may be a good person. You may be given money to charity and so on. But you still rebel against God. There is inside each one of us that rebellious uh, streak. And so imagine that we have in this uh, death row 10 people. They're going to be hanged. Why? Because they have committed a capital offense and hanging was in the, the law of that land. They have robbed a bank, killed innocent women and children in the process of uh, robbing the bank. So we got all these 10 people. And the governor of that city says, well, once a year I will give a pardon. I will pardon this particular person. 
would you say is not fair? You probably say, well, why should you pardon? You know, you should not pardon. Our hearts would say, well, it's not about why God chose certain people and chose not. All of us deserve to be condemned. The fact that God chose some is to show God's mercy. And that's all we can say is that it's nothing to do about God's being fair or not, but it's all about God's mercy and His sovereign choice. That's all we can rejoice in, that God has shown us mercy. That's why He chose you and me and others yet, you know, to come into His kingdom. That is a great spiritual blessing. Isn't that a great spiritual blessing? That God has chosen you and me before the creation of the world. And He will see us through to the end. Secondly, in verse 4, it says we are chosen to be pure and blameless before Him. Now, that is a very powerful statement as well. To be chosen, to be pure and blameless. This is in the heart of God. You know, God may use circumstances, even through financial blessings, it can be, or financial hardship, whatever. Disappointment with your friends, or you may be encouraged by your friends, in any circumstance that God will use. But His aim is to present us pure and blameless before Him. And what it means is that God did not choose you because you are pure, right? This is how I would deduce from this statement. God chose you so that He can make you pure. It's nothing to do with how religious you become. It's not dependent on because I know of some people who say, look, I'm not able to follow Jesus because I'm not good enough. Wait till I do some more good works. Then I, uh, Jesus will accept me. No, forget about it. Just as uh, the, the authors of this uh, hymn, just as I am, without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me and that you bid me to come to you, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. It's nothing to do with what good things or what bad things. God knows already where you're at. But He said, I come to choose you to be pure and blameless. Well, others may feel that, you know, I'm, I'm quite good, you know, God, you should choose me. Then you end up become like the Pharisees, uh, thinking that you are, you're full of self-righteousness. Again, this statement tells you that, you know, you will not be able to make it as a self-righteous person. Neither do we need do you need to improve yourself until you're so good that God will accept you? Just as you are, when God chose you, assure yourself, God just chose you just as you are. In fact, He thought about you before the world was made. Isn't that good news? We don't have to slog in that sense. We just trust God that God knows and He will present you and me pure and blameless before Him. And in the end, it's about removing all our guilt, you know, to come before Christ. Wow, you know. He is a pure and holy one. How would I stand? And this is where God's plan is because we're going to move to the next uh, point that thirdly, uh, that in verse 7, that God has chosen us at a great cost, at a great cost to Himself. In case you doubt God's love, I'm telling you that His plan of salvation cost God a lot. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who used uh, to, while he was alive, he preached at the Westminster Chapel. He would say that the greatest problem that God ever, that God has faced, even more challenging than creating the galaxies and, uh, you, know, with his, you know, with His word, let there be light and so on, was to deal with how to bring about forgiveness for a fallen and rebellious creation. To God, that is a greater problem and challenge. Because forgiveness from God cannot be just say, I forgive you, it's fine, I'm the God of the universe. I know you're made of dust, I can forgive you. Because sin has to do with something that uh, has caused something to, uh, that needs a debt to be paid. That's why you need a redemption. So if I go to the pawn, sh uh, P -O -P -A -P -A pawn shop okay, to pawn my ring and so on, you, you need to redeem it. All right? Otherwise, that would be uh, forfeited. So in the same way, God has to pay something to redeem. He cannot just close his eyes. Because God is not just a God of mercy, but a God, not just a God of love and mercy, but also a God of justice. He has to pay something to pay off that debt that you and I have incurred because of our sin. And therefore, Jesus came, became a man. He took on the human nature, not just a divine nature, but also a human nature. 
so that he can stand in place of Adam that has fallen, that he can take the sin of the world upon himself. He has to pay that debt. He has to pay for that redemption. And he also took on a body. He says sacrifice in Hebrews uh, 10 verse 5, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you're not pleased, but I'm, then I say, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I've come to do your will, O God. So even Jesus took on himself, not just a human nature, but also a body in the flesh to come to save us. That is what cost God. Isn't that a spiritual blessing? That our debt is paid? And how it will wrench the Father's heart of God to see His Son being crucified on the cross. I know what it is when my daughters go through pain and so on. You know, I feel for her. You know. So in the same way, God who's love and in the triune God, that there's one God and yet three persons, God would, the Father would really feel that pain uh, as Jesus died for our sins. Therefore, Abram sacrificing Isaac was just a foreshadow of what God would sacrifice his son. But of course, what Abram did not do, God did. And Jesus himself have to contend, right, in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, not let this cup of suffering pass by me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus himself has to battle through, you know, to obey uh, God, the Father, in order to be uh, the sin-bearer for all of us. So let us, therefore, recognize that we are chosen at great cost to God. And what does that mean? It means that you are precious in the sight of God. You and I are so precious in the sight of God. And do not, therefore, believe the lies of the devil to say that you are good for nothing, that society has no use for you, that you're not good enough, I told you already, you do not need to be good enough. God has chosen you and He will present you blameless and pure on the last day. Okay? So we should, therefore, in our response to God, is always that of a gratitude. In all that we serve, even becoming soldiers for Jesus, even doing healing on the streets, serving us in the cell groups, opening our homes, and people dirtying your, your house, you know, you, you do it out of gratitude for Jesus. Not because you must, but because you want to. This is the expression of your love language to God. In expression of gratitude, therefore we serve Him. And also, because we have the DNA of God. Because that leads us to the next uh, spiritual blessing in verse 5, that we are chosen to be adopted sons through Jesus Christ. So first of all, we are chosen before the creation of the world. Secondly, we are chosen... Uh, to be presented pure and blameless before Him. And we are chosen, thirdly, at great cost. And fourthly, we are chosen to be the adopted sons to Jesus Christ. Do you know that in the plan of God, God does not want us to be a slave. You have to understand what's the difference between a slave and a son. In Galatians, Paul actually made it very clear. You know, a slave is, has, has no status. A slave is there in order to please the master. He is ba uh, a slave is given food based on his performance. If he does not do his work well, no food for him. Give him a beating. That's what the slave deserves. But if you are a son, that's your status. It does not really in one sense matter whether you do anything or not. You are still the son of the house. You have a status. You have, uh, even as an adopted son, because you can't be like Jesus. Jesus is God. So he, at best, at the highest form that God can uh, elevate us to is to be the adopted son of God. That this is what we are chosen to be, adopted sons of God. So when you are adopted, and Paul will understand that term, because in Roman times, if you are adopted, it means that it's a legal transaction. You become just like, you have the same rights as that of a natural born uh, son of the, of the master. You have a name. The name of the family belongs to you. That is your new identity as an adopted son. You have an inheritance as an adopted son. You have full rights as an adopted son. And this is what God wants us to have. 
This is why we are chosen to become the adopted sons to Jesus Christ. And why sons? Why not daughters? You know, some of you ladies may feel a bit, may question in your heart. Well, Paul made it very clear, it's adopted sons. Why? So that it includes whether you're female or male. You have the same rights. With no shadow of a doubt. Because at that time, women, females have no, uh, has a very low status at that time. So Paul made it very clear that whether you're a woman or man, when you are chosen by God, you are an adopted son. It's not so much to talk about the sex aspect. It's talk about the understanding at that time, what does it mean to be an adopted son? Without a shadow of doubt that you have the same rights, the same inheritance as a, 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 a male. And therefore, if we are sons, we don't need to strive to be recognized in this world. In this world, there's a rat race. You know, and people are saying that we climb so high on the social, on the economic ladder and so on, only to find that the ladder was stacked on the wrong wall. You know, we strive to be recognized, we strive to be approved, and so on. But when you know that in the, if you go up from your earthly, earthbound environment to uh, the heavenly perspective, that's what Paul was saying, then you realize that if you are the son of God, you don't really need to strive to be approved because you are already the son. I don't have to prove myself to be, the, to be a member of the Lou family. I'm already a member of the Lou family. My name is Peter Lou. Right? It does not matter whether I'm rich or poor compared to my siblings or my cousins. I am a member of the family. I don't need to strive to prove to people. So in the same way, when you know that you are a child of God, you also have that inheritance. God will give us an unfading inheritance. We don't really know exactly what that inheritance is. It's definitely much better than money and gold, for sure. Can it be like we are just like Christ? That we have His wisdom, His purity, His love, His power, His joy, His creativity, or part of it, I don't know. Maybe certain aspects of it will be our inheritance. How amazing it will be on that day. So we can't wait for that to happen. And as I say, we all have the DNA. And therefore, part of our motivation to serve God is that firstly, is an expression of our gratitude, of God's great love towards us, and what has caused God to sacrifice to save us. And secondly, that we have that DNA. Why? Because God's seed is in us. I talk about it in the, was it 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, that the seed of God abides in us. There is a DNA that God has put inside us. And later on, we talk about how God has also given us the Holy Spirit. And finally, this another spiritual blessing is that we are chosen by God for the praise of God's glory. In other words, God is center stage. That's what it should be. If you imagine that we are all like an orchestra, all right, you're not really the center stage. All of us are there, but God is in the center stage. And all of us are like musical instruments that we are here to praise and worship God. Unless, let's say you're a harmonica, it's unless air is being blown into you, you will never be like the harmonica was supposed to design for. You see what I'm saying? But when you, so the harmonica is, is there to exist for the glory of that, in that time of singing and, and, and so on. So we have, uh, we have to realize that we are chosen for the praise of God's glory. God should be in the center stage. So we are no longer uh, uh, to lead a life of slavery, but of sonship. And uh, we are there to give delight to God. This is what it means, right? We talk about spiritual blessing. There's a contentment, happiness in our relationship with God. So we live there to please God, to make God happy. But do you think that God actually needs us to make Him happy? He's blessed. He's happy. But it's in so doing that we make God happy that we really discover the richness and the fullness of, of, sorry, the, of being fully alive as a child of God. It's just a harmonica. Unless it's being blown, all right? No sound comes out of you. You're not quite fully alive, even though you are a, a musical instrument. But until, you know, God blows His, his wind you know, through this harmonica, you suddenly spring to life. This is what you're designed for. And of course, the music you gave is... It's a, it's a praise, it's a worship. That's, that's part of your design. That's what you're meant to do. That's what you're meant to live your life for. So whether it's 
in church that we sing to glorify God, in our prayers to glorify God, or whether in your workplace. That's why we, we are asked to do things excellently, not to please man, not when your boss is around. But even when your boss is not around, we do it. Why? Because we are chosen for the praise of God's glory. In so doing, you know, we become fully alive. So, from now until eternity, what's going to happen? God's plan does not just stop like here, I, I tell you so, I told you so, but uh, here he tells us that God has put in each one of us the Holy Spirit as a deposit, as a, a seal, as a mark. So if somebody put a seal on you, that means, you know, you are branded, you are owned by that person, you are proven to be authentic. So the Holy Spirit gives us that assurance of the powers of the kingdom to come. People ask you, how do you know that Jesus is true? You say, well, I just know it in my heart that this is the case. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one that gives you that assurance. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives you power, anointing, to tell you that there is power in the kingdom of God, even here, for us to live out our lives as sons of God, which we'll hear a bit more next week. The Holy Spirit also will discipline us, right? Because we are sons of God. If you are not a son of God, God says, I will not discipline you. But because you are my son, therefore I will discipline you. Therefore, in life, you may go through some hard knocks, but accept that as part of God's way of His plan so that you'll be presented pure and home, uh, blameless before Him on that day. And finally, from now until eternity, God's going to unite everything to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In fact, the word to bring together, to unite, um, as some commentators say, is not just unite, but to reunite. There's another Greek word to say, reunite. In other words, sometime in the past, there was a disintegration of the order of God. And God is now bringing everything back together, reuniting. And so we'll see more and more things being brought back under the headship of Jesus. At this point in time, there may be a lot of chaos, but God is working out His plan. And we must be confident and we know that this is going to happen. So let us recap as we conclude. I've listed five spiritual blessings. There are many more. Okay, chosen by God the Father before the creation of the world. And God will not forget you in the past and He will not forget you in the future. Chosen to be pure and blameless before Him. You don't have to strive. You just let the Spirit of God mold you. You just love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength as gratitude. You don't have to prove yourself to anybody because you are a child of God. Also, tell yourself that, you know, you are precious because you are chosen at great cost to the Godhead. And you're also chosen for the praise. Not to live for your glory. You know, the harmonica doesn't exist on its own. It's there as part of the orchestra, but the wind has to blow through it. So in the same way, we are chosen for God's glory. And this plan will help us to perhaps uh, uh, explain the sort of... the. Uh, five or six existential questions I've raised. Who am I? Who am I? You should be able to answer that question. Who am I? You should be able to answer the question, what, is, what, what, am, I, what am I here for? You should be able to answer the question, who is God? You should be able to answer the question, why would God allow evil? What has He done anything, has he done anything about it? You should be able to answer the question, what will I do when I face God on the day of judgment? So how then should we live? How then should we live from now? We should live like what Paul would intend us to do because he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. That we must always carry that blueprint of God's plan as our grit when we live this life. When we go through different situations, whether in happy times or challenging times, uh, that you may be, you may be in, the, in the prison of fear. You have to look up to God. You may be trapped in your prison of work. to say, oh, yeah, I work like a slave. You know, my boss is very oppressive. My colleagues don't understand me. You may be trapped in the prison where you have uh, broken relationships with one another. You have to look to the plan of God. You have to look to God to say, God, you are working according to your plan. Help me to respond accordingly. You may be trapped in a prison where you say, I'm worthless. 
I'm insignificant. I have nothing to show in life. I'm a born loser. But you look at the plan of God. God says, I have chosen you. All right, you follow me. I will lead you. I will bring you to, I will present you pure and blameless before him. I'll be so proud of you on that day. You may not be proud of yourself here. I hope it's not because of your sin. Because if you sin, then God will discipline you. You can be sure of that. But if you walk with God as his son or daughter, in this case, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you know that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. All right? You have to keep telling yourself. The devil will lie to you and say, no, you see, God has forsaken you. You're not really his choice. You know? God has better choices than you. God has favorites. And so that's not true. The Bible tells us that God has thoughts about you already. So you have to hang on. And this is how Paul would be able to overcome his situation in prison. Paul has not forgotten, right? He kept saying he's a prisoner three times in the letter. But yet he was able to break out in praise. And he was successful in his mission work in prison because in Philippians, a letter of Philippians, say even the whole of the Roman Praetorian Guard have heard the gospel because he kept preaching to them while in prison. This is amazing that God can cause us to abound beyond what we can ever ask or imagine. So let us end as we bow our heads in prayer and just to meditate on this glorious blueprint of God. So carry this blueprint with you. All right, when you go through difficult situations, just read chapter 1 of Ephesians 1. That will help you to break out of your prison walls. Respond to God with thanksgiving. How amazing that the mystery of the will of God is revealed to us. That we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I want you to think also about what prisons do you think that you are locked in? Some of these prisons is something that God may want you to break out because those prisons are webs that the enemy has put in around you. Some prisons may be real. You may be going through a tough time in relationship because God is training you. You feel, oh, I'm trapped. I don't know what to do. That may be a true case. But there may be other prisons that is not from God. And you need to understand, uh, receive the wisdom and revelation from the Spirit of God who is your counsellor, who lives in you, to break out of that. So let's spend some time to reflect over this. Lord Jesus, thank you that we are in you. And so many references of in you, in him, in the beloved, in Christ. That, Lord, we are hidden in you. And all the resources, Lord, that you have given to us are found in you. Our salvation, Lord, is in you. Our hope, Lord, is in you. The way, Lord, you're going to see us through to the end is in you. And you, Lord, are to be glorified. We thank you, Lord, for this great plan of yours that we are chosen. Lord, how amazing it is to be chosen by you even before the creation of the world. Nothing to do with what we have done or not done. That you just have chosen us to be presented pure and blameless, to be adopted as sons before the Most High God. To be blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. To be chosen, Lord, for the praise and glory of your name. What a privilege, Lord, to be an instrument of praise to the Almighty God, the King of the universe. Therefore, Lord, help us not to forget of this blueprint of yours, of your plan, that have caused you so much to bring it into fruition and still working through it. So thank you, Lord. Help us not to strive, but Lord, to rest on you 
But at the same time, Lord, to take on our role as sonship. Lord, to respond to you in gratitude to your love towards us so that we not find that the things we do become a chore, that we are there, Lord, to please you even in our workplace, even in our home, even in our situation, a difficult situation. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder whether there's anyone while eyes are closed that you may really want to find out a bit more about Jesus, to say, I want to know this Jesus. I want to know this plan. I, you know, this is part of maybe God choosing you already. That's why you're responding. And if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. You say, I want to know more about this Jesus. I'm, I'm not a Christian, but I want to know more of this Jesus. You just want to put out your hand so that I can give you some materials. This is a family, so don't worry, all right? Just raise, raise up your hand briefly. Thank you for that hand. Any more hands? Any more hands? Raise high so that I can see. Yeah. Okay. So come forward and I'll, later on we'll give you some materials. Thank you for that. Now I want to, um, since it's the start of the year, it's really to uh, uh, dedicate and to acknowledge in a sense that uh, your work in the workplace, in the marketplace, uh, or in the home is very important to God. In, our, in other words, we do not segregate your so-called secular life from God. Your work in the marketplace is just as important to God as your work in the church. So somebody has identified seven uh, pillars that constitute, the, 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 that make up the culture of a society. So I want to, to really dedicate all of you who worked in different pillars uh, in society. So there's, there's seven in total. And I'm going to ask different people to come and pray. So you just stand where you are. We're going to say, Lord, we want to bless our workplace. We want to, to bring before God our workplaces. Our workplaces may not be sanctified. They're not Christian. Uh, but we want to believe that God sends me and you to, you know, certain places to be the light uh, and to shine for Jesus. So I'm going to start off with education. I'm going to ask Richard Hindley who's a teacher himself. So any one of you who, uh, who works in education as a teacher and, and so on, teaching, uh, just stand and we'll just pray for you. All right? This is a time when we're going to ask God to bless you, to acknowledge you. You're doing a great, important work. Those in the field of education, just stand. Maybe we can ask uh, students to stand as well. And also maybe the children because you're in education. That's true. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came to earth and that you yourself were a student and that you yourself became a teacher. Lord, we pray for everybody involved in the field of education, whether as students or teachers. Lord, I just pray that they would be salt and light in their situation, in their uh, schools, in their universities. Uh, Lord, wherever they are, a student or wherever they're a teacher. And Lord, that you would just use them. You would use them to bring life. You would use them to bring uh, love and to bring joy and to bring peace into their uh, workplaces, into the places where they learn. So Lord, I commit them to you for 2014 in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Amen. Uh, please be seated. Good to look around afterwards to see who are the people in the same pillar. The next pillar is the finance. Uh, those in finance, uh, the finance industry, uh, in business, uh, corporations, all right, those who are there uh, working in those areas. I asked Nam Singh, our, our former treasurer, our council member, to pray for us. So let's all stand, all of you who deal with money, accountants, auditors. I ask the Lord to bless your work, your hands. Those in the banking, uh, companies, business as well, okay? Um, those who work in uh, factories, uh, I would put that in the same category, okay? Uh, furthermore, I have uh, politics, I have uh, community, medicine, religion, media, and entertainment. So if you're not in that category, just stand, all right? <coughs> Father, okay. we thank you there. <coughs> for reminding us that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And that, Lord, this blessing is only from you alone and by grace. So, Father, we pray for all of us who, are, who work in the finance sector. And this is an area where corruption, self-interest <coughs> can be 
very, can be in the very core of the business. And Father, we believe that as sons and daughters, that you have called us into this sector, you grant us the ability, the strength, the understanding to, uh, to be men and women of integrity. That Lord, we can live as sons and daughters. Mm. That we can live as one depending on you and not on the financial wealth and riches of this world. So Father, we pray that Lord, <coughs> as one called by you, one redeemed by our Lord Jesus Christ, that we can be a symbol of righteousness even in these corrupt uh, places. So Father, we pray that you bless the work of the hands of the people to have that spiritual input and influence among those in this financial sector. And then Lord, you also prosper the works of your people and then Lord, by the lifestyle of as one live out the truth of the gospel that your name be glorified even in the workplace because that is what we are called and that is what we are we belong to you and we live as one belong to you in Jesus name we pray Amen, Amen. Amen. Thank you Nam Singh Please be seated The next uh, category is uh, politics so I'm going to ask Connie I know that she's uh, not a politician but she does pray for the government so anyone working uh, who's an MP here, working in politics in the government, you want to stand? Okay. Father, we just uh, pray for our government. And Father, I pray for every single politician, and especially, Lord, for those who are Christian, that they will stand against anything that is not pleasing to you and that we will still um, maintain this as a Christian country. And Father, I'm, th I'm just so grateful to you that we are still allowed to worship here freely at, uh, on a Sunday. And Father, I just pray that this will continue to be so. And so bless, bless every one of those politicians, Lord, I pray, and especially for those who are Christian to stand against anything that is not pleasing for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And for one, that one brother, we just bless you in your political involvement that God gives you success. Amen. Okay, next is a family, uh, social work. If you're a social worker, community work, medicine, okay, just stand. And we'll ask Sarah, our e-kids, uh, head off, will pray for us. Okay, all stand those in social work going to commit. Uh, you're a nurse, you're a doctor, social worker, community workers. We'll ask the Lord to bless uh, your work. Father, we thank you for all these brothers and sisters that will touch life. We want to speak your word that's living a life into their being. That indeed, how precious is your loving kindness towards them. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is a fountain of life. In your light we see light. Lord, we want to bless all these brothers and sisters that touches life. We pray, oh Lord God, that they be the light for you, Lord. The light that is put high and above, that all people will see you and know that they are your people and they shine forth your light, that through them, through their work, the work of their hands, that many will come to salvation in Christ. And I want to speak and declare this blessing over all of them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I especially want to lift up families to you. Families that will not be assaulted by the enemy. Families that will not break up but they will stay in unity. I pray for husband and wife. I pray for love in their family and out there in the community. Everyone will look at them and say, I want the God that they have. That through problems, through difficulties, through good times, I can see their light shining for Jesus. And I want to know their God that they believe in. I thank you, Lord God, for families that you have sent out there. And I continue to stand on the prophetic word for families. That Lord, even as they look around, as they look in, because you have encircled them, 
with your protection, with a wall that when they look in the wall and they see families thriving in our church, they will wonder why and they'll be curious. And as they look in, they want to be like those families, how you have blessed them, how you have protected them, how you have provided for them. And that Lord God, that through them, many will come to salvation in Christ. Therefore, we bless all the families. We bless all the work of the hands of those in the social, in medicine, uh, in, in the community work, that Lord God, they are the light shining for you. We praise you and thank you for every one of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And uh, I hope Pastor Chua can uh, pray for us for the pillar of religion in a minute. Uh, let's ask um, Pastor Chua. Sorry, I didn't give him any notice. Uh, but we'll move on to the next one first so he has a bit of time. Uh, we're going to pray for the media, those in the media. Karen's going to pray. And after that, Pastor Chua will pray for the religion, uh, those in the pillar of religion. Let's, uh, those of media stand, yeah. Father God, we thank you that you are the original and the best creator. And we thank you that you have made us in your image. So I lift up today all those who are working or studying or volunteering or who feel called to the sector of media, Lord, that you will inspire and empower every single one of them to really reflect and express your truth, your love and your creativity in everything that they do and being confident that they've been made in your image. Lord, I ask that you would position them at the head and not the tail Amen. of their media sector, that you would bless them with a spirit of godly excellence and far-reaching influence over all the audiences they serve. And let their fruit um, be rooted in lives which are grounded in you and in your love, Lord. Father, I pray that you would establish your kingdom reign in all the realms of media, in print and publishing, marketing, advertising, in the internet, radio, TV, social media, Lord. And we ask in the name of Jesus that you would tear down the enemy's strongholds, Father, that have been deceiving people with the enemy's lies all these years, Lord. Give us the conviction that you've called us to be agents of change, Lord. Lord, we want to say that we give you permission to use us to reclaim the media for your glory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Now I'm going to ask our Pastor Chua to pray for those in the pillar of religion. I think those of us who are so-called full-time, I think we should stand. I suppose all of us are in the pillar of religion, right? We all should stand. Okay. We're all serving in the church, in the kingdom of God. So let's just pray. Ask Pastor Chua, our former senior pastor, to bless us as well. Lord, we thank you that in the past you have chosen people to serve you in your sanctuary. You have ordained from the house of Aaron, priests, and then you call Levites to sing your praises, to lead your people in worship. And then in even the New Testament, you ordain people like pastors, prophets, apostles, uh, teachers to proclaim your word and we thank you above all that in the New Testament you call all of us to be priests and that we are your royal priesthood so we pray Lord that we may learn to equip people in all sectors of life and all professions and callings to serve you so give us that wisdom give us that ability to train to encourage and to build people up that they will be salt and light in their families, in their communities, in their societies, and even the nations. So thank you, Lord, for calling us to be your priests. Make us, Lord, uh, people who be faithful to your calling. We may be able to be a blessing to many. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Uh, is there anybody who's in uh, entertainment, uh, arts, who has not stood up, you want to stand up? I'm going to ask Joanne to come and pray if there's anyone. Okay, there's some. Okay. It's a very important area arts, entertainment. Father God, we just thank you that you have chosen us and you've blessed us with so many creative giftings to be used for your glory. I thank you, Father, that you've made us vessels to carry your presence. I thank you that we are called to be bearers of truth mm. and light. And today, even as a church, we want to stand and we want to claim back what the devil has stolen from us. 
And Father, the creative giftings of entertainment to bring joy and laughter, peace and love, wholeness, we claim them back for the church and that we will arise and stand firm for you to proclaim your glory. Help us to be in the, indeed those channels, those channels of love and truth and to bring reconciliation back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. And finally, is uh, all the rest. I'm asking Sing to, uh, who's semi-retired, all those who are retired, those who have not been in any of the categories, you can stand as well, okay? Anyone to stand? Yeah. Well, this is the eight pillars that I forgot. The retired, semi-retired, and about to retire, or those who are unemployed. You are not falling into the seven pillars at the moment, okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters who have served you faithfully all the years. Father, for those of us who have retired, semi-retired, or about to retire, Lord, at this season of our life, Lord, Amen. we may learn to redeem our time for you, that we will not waste our time at this hour, that we will be like a cedar tree of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord, we will bear fruit even at old age, always stay fresh and green. So, Lord, we want to pray that you continue to give us your Holy Spirit and give us your joy of the Lord to serve you in this season of life. And those for those who are unemployed, Lord, seeking employment, our Lord, Lord, you open doors for them, for them to fall into one of the seven pillars, the career that they are a desire, so that the career will be a glory to you. So, and for the rest, Lord, we pray that you be with them. And first of all, Lord, we pray for good health. Good health is our portion, so that we have life to serve you. It's the mm. living that can praise you, Amen. not the dead. Father, I want to pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit. That Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than what we ask and imagine, according to the Holy Spirit power at work within us. To him be the glory in this church and in Christ throughout all generations. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Well, let's stand as we sing the last uh, song. Well, few encourage the Lord's. Uh, the Word of God says that in Proverbs 16, verse 3, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. Let's all stand as we respond also with the message that you have been chosen. Oh, yeah. 